let's see, let's share the screen. Okay, perfect. So um, today we're gonna uh, shift gear a little bit and, uh, and, and uh, stop working with our uh, uh, toy model that we've used uh, during the first two lectures to introduce uh, a lot of uh, EFT concepts. And uh, um, we instead turn our attention to an effective theory that actually describes something that is observed in experiments, namely Carnap perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, um, so the reason why we do that is because, um, so I've argued many times that uh, um, effective theories uh, um, should contain all the terms that are compatible with the symmetries. And especially during the Q and A's, there were a few questions about uh, how can we make sure that we write down all the terms uh, um, and we don't forget any. Um, well, so when symmetries are uh, linearly realized or when symmetries are discrete, for instance, like parity in the previous toy model, um, it is usually fairly simple to write down uh, um, all possible terms uh, that, uh, um, that are compatible with the symmetries. Uh, so for instance, if you have uh, uh, a field that transforms linearly under some, let's say, internal symmetry, where this matrix M could be an SO matrix or an SU matrix, then ensuring that you write down terms that are invariant under the symmetries um, is, uh, um, let's see. Okay. Then uh, um, ensuring that you write down terms that are invariant under the symmetries is, um, is quite trivial. It's just a matter of contracting indices in an invariant way. Right? However, uh, implementing symmetries is not always so uh, straightforward. And so over the last uh, uh, remaining three lectures, today, tomorrow, and on Friday, we'll consider instances where uh, symmetries are realized in a more complicated way. So for instance, uh, where symmetries are spontaneously broken, uh, in, in which case, as we will see, they, are, uh, they act on the, um, on the Goldstone uh, fields uh, and on the Goldstone modes, which must be there um, as predicted by Goldstone's theorem, uh, they act on these fields in a, a nonlinear uh, way. So they are nonlinearly realized. And so it's not just a matter of contracting indices now. We need to be a little more, more clever. Uh, we'll discuss also situations situations where uh, uh, symmetries are not exact, but they are approximate, okay? So they're broken by some term in the effective action, but these terms are in some sense, which uh, needs to be made precise depending on the theory at hand, are in some sense small compared to the other terms. Uh, we will discuss what happens when some symmetries are uh, anomalous, which means uh, uh, they are broken by uh, quantum effects. Uh, and uh, in the last lectures, we also talk about uh, um, accidental symmetries. Um, I know that Andrea has already uh, discussed uh, accidental symmetries in the context of the standard model, for instance, uh, uh, baryon number. Um, so we'll try to give a more, uh, a more general uh, overview and I'll give you a different example of an accidental symmetry in a different context. Uh, for now, what we're gonna do is tackle these first uh, three instances and we'll do them, uh, we, we'll discuss these aspects in the concrete example uh, of chiral perturbation theory. Okay. So chiral perturbation theory is nothing but the effective theory of light mesons, okay? So light, light bound state in QCD, whereby light, I mean, say masses, masses below uh, the GV. So if we are interested in uh, describing 
bound states that are lighter than a GV, um, then you know, we can take the standard model Lagrangian and according to the, the ideology that we have been developed uh, uh, in these first two lectures, we can integrate out, if you want, all the fields that are, uh, um, uh, all the particles that are heavier than a GV. And what we'll end up with is uh, focusing on the quark sector um, and their strong interactions, we end up with a Lagrangian of this form with three quarks, namely U, D, and S, and then uh, uh, electromagnetic interactions, the photon, the gluon field, strong interactions, and then, of course, a slew of uh, um, irrelevant or non renormalizable operators. And uh, the covariant derivatives that act on the fermions is just uh, uh, defined as usual as ordinary derivative minus a piece that contains uh, the photon field minus a piece that contains the gluon field. Very good. Now, uh, the mass scales that appear now in, in this Lagrangian are uh, uh, the three masses of the quarks. And then there is a, a fourth scale, which is uh, uh, not apparent in this Lagrangian, but it's a um, um, confinement scale of QCD, lambda QCD. And uh, it turns out that in nature, the masses of this quark are smaller than lambda QCD. So uh, this is say of order 300 MeV, we could say, and the, the masses of the quark uh, of the lightest quarks are of order MeV for the U and D quark, and say of order 100 MeV for the strange quark. And so uh, this suggests that uh, to study bound states, we can start uh, with an approximation, which is uh, uh, amounts to neglecting the quark masses uh, compared to the lambda QCD scale. Okay. So admittedly, this is gonna be a much better um, approximation say for the U and D quarks versus for the strange quark. And in fact, uh, this will be reflected in uh, how well uh, uh, the framework we will develop uh, will match actually with experiment. Uh, but still it's, uh, it turns out to be a, a decently good approximation uh, even for the strange quark, at least to get a qualitative picture of uh, what kind of bound states we expect at low energies. Um, and in fact, we'll double down and neglect not only uh, the masses of, uh, of the quarks, but also uh, their couplings to um, electromagnetism, okay? And that's again, because uh, uh, alpha and electromagnetism is a small number. And so we can, uh, uh, especially at low energies uh, where uh, strong interactions uh, become strong, uh, it is reasonable to assume that in a first approximation, we can neglect electromagnetic interactions and we can then reintroduce them in perturbation theory. Okay, so this is the limit that uh, we're gonna work in. And in this limit, uh, uh, it's convenient to take the, the quark fields and uh, break them up into their left-handed and right-handed parts. And okay. defined uh, like so with this projector that uses gamma five. Okay. So when we do that and rewrite our action in terms of the left-handed and right-handed field, it takes this form. Sum of all the quarks, psi lj i gamma mu 
d mu minus i j d mu psi l j plus the same term with the left replaced by right. And then we have, of course, uh, uh, the kinetic term for the gluons plus a bunch of irrelevant operators. Very good. So notice that, uh, uh, so this is of course in within this approximation. And notice that now by neglecting the, uh, the quark masses, uh, uh, the left and right-handed parts of the fermions uh, decouple from each other. And uh, this approximate action has uh, uh, in fact many symmetries as a result. The first symmetry of this action is uh, conformal symmetry, okay? As you can see, now that we've neglected the quark masses, uh, there is no scale left in the problem uh, in the terms that I wrote down. However, conformal symmetry is not actually um, an exact symmetry of this theory still because uh, uh, confinement still, still takes place and uh, it takes place at a certain scale because uh, the, um, the QCD coupling runs and at some point uh, the theory becomes strongly coupled, right? And uh, there is a scale that emerges, uh, lambda QCD, that uh, uh, is you know, a preferred scale where the coupling becomes of order one. And so the fact that there is a notion of a preferred scale in the, in the theory uh, tells you that scale invariance is, uh, and therefore conformal is also, um, it's not an exact symmetry. Okay. So because of that, we're not gonna worry about this. There is also a, a large internal symmetry group which consists of two factors of U3 uh, that act on the core fields on their left-handed and uh, right-handed parts separately by rotating them separately. Okay. And uh, um, in fact, it is helpful to decompose this large internal group as a product of different factors by extracting uh, the U1 subgroup from each of these U3s and rewriting these as SU3, SU3 left, the SU3 that acts on the left-handed quarks cross SU3 right, and then for the two U1s, rather than working in a basis of U1 left and U1 right, I'll actually work in a basis of U1V cross U1A, vector and axial, where the U1V part simply uh, describes global rephasings, meaning rephasings of all the quark, uh, both left-handed and right-handed. Whereas, uh, in contrast, the U1 axial defines rephasings that are opposite, meaning if I rephase psi left this way, then I'm going to rephase psi right with the opposite phase. Okay. So all these factors that I wrote uh, have a somewhat different status in, uh, um, uh, have, have a different status. So let me start with uh, U1A. As I mentioned, this is also known as axial symmetry. 
And it turns out that this symmetry is actually anomalous. So it's not preserved by quantum corrections. And I'm gonna have more to say about it in the next lecture. Okay? So for now, let's just set it aside. And let's consider this other product, uh, SU3. Yeah. Excuse me, Ricardo. Okay. Uh, Please. I'm interrupting you because we have some problem, some maybe some delay. So we are not able to see everything that you're writing. Oh, okay. So we, we always see, okay, I think like this is probably better. Okay, so let me try to uh, go on and uh, at what point was it uh, delayed from the very beginning or? Uh, no, uh, the from, from point two, but I think it's now fine. Okay, so um, very good. So uh, thank you. If it happens again, please uh, yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. jump in. Yes. Um, very good. So what I did is I, I, I broke up this uh, U3 left and right, uh, cross uh, U, U3 right uh, in the product uh, uh, of, of these factors. And now the, uh, we discussed the U1A, the axial symmetry. We said it's anomalous. Now the SU3 left cross SU3R is known as uh, chiral symmetry. And it turns out that chiral symmetry is actually spontaneously broken. Because strong interactions cause this operator to acquire a non-trivial verb. Okay, this is gonna have mass dimension three, so there is gonna be some scale V uh, cubed times delta ij. And as you can see, because of the delta ij, this verb is not invariant separately under uh, in independent rotations of SU3L and SU3R, but it's only invariant when uh, both uh, you rotate simultaneously with the same matrix, both the right-handed and left-handed curves. In other words, SU3 left cross SU3R is broken down to the diagonal subgroup, which uh, in analogy with the U1, I'm gonna call also SU3 vector, where both the left-handed and right-handed uh, quarks um, um, uh, rotate uh, simultaneously. Okay. Finally, we're left with the, the UMV, which uh, is nothing but familiar baryon symmetry, if you want, as implemented on the quarks. And as Andrea discussed in his lectures, this is an example of accidental symmetry. And we'll, we'll say more about that um, in the coming lectures about accidental symmetries. Notice in particular, emphatically that U1V is not spontaneously broken, okay? So if you rephrase uh, uh, with the same phase, uh, right-handed, left-handed quarks, this operator doesn't change. This is neutral under uh, U1V. Uh, and for this reason, uh, um, the bound states uh, are going to have a definite, uh, a definite variant charge. Okay. Very good. So the... Um, starting point of chiral perturbation theory, the EFT we're going to discuss today, is the observation that if chiral symmetry is spontaneously broken, there have to be, according to Goldstone's theorem, eight number Goldstone bosons at very low energies, okay? These are, these are mass states. And uh, um, Olson's theorem tells us that uh, they should be there. Okay? So if we integrate, uh, um, if we go to low energies, we should be able to describe what's going on in this limit uh, with a theory that only involves uh, 
um, the Goldstone modes. Okay? And this theory is called a perturbation theory. The expansion parameter in this theory that we're going to write down is going to be, again, a ratio of energy of the typical processes you're considering divided by some strong capri scale lambda that needs to be determined at this point. Okay. And notice that uh, chiral perturbation theory is a more um, complicated example, if you want, compared to the toy model we considered uh, um, in the first two lectures, because the Goldstone fields do not appear in the Lagrangian um, uh, in, in our original Lagrangian, okay? Uh, so this is unlike, say, uh, in uh, uh, the standard model where uh, uh, the Goldstones, of course, get eaten by the gauge bosons, so, but in principle, you can identify them with uh, some components of, uh, of the Higgs field. Here instead, uh, there is no trace of uh, Goldstone uh, modes in, uh, in this original Lagrangian. Nevertheless, we have a very general argument named the Goldstone theorem that tells us that at low energies, they should be there. And so what we're gonna do is uh, go after an effective theory for these Goldstone modes, okay? So this is a special example where, uh, another way of saying it is that uh, uh, the UV completion of chiral perturbation theory, this effective theory that we will write down, is, uh, uh, is strongly coupled and therefore, unlike in the toy model we've considered uh, uh, in the first two lectures, one cannot do a matching calculation analytically. Matching needs to be done by comparing the effective theory either with numerical simulations or with experiments. Okay, so we, we've nailed down the first ingredient, which is uh, our particle content. Now going down the list, uh, uh, the next ingredient of our EFT should be the symmetries. And so we need to figure out how chiral symmetry is going to act on, uh, um, on the Nampu Goldstone bosons. And for that, let me start with a simple example. Okay? Uh, an example where we have a spontaneously broken U1 at weak coupling meaning where we have a perturbative model, say with a scalar field with the classical uh, Mexican hat potential. The scalar field is going to acquire a VEV corresponding to the minimum of this potential. And as we know, a convenient parameterization of perturbations around this VEV uh, uses uh, what is known as the radial mode, which is uh, uh, a massive mode that describes fluctuations in this direction. And then a uh, phase which uh, describes fluctuations around the valley. Uh, and as we know, that corresponds to, to the Goldstone boson. So this is kind of a general feature, the fact that this is a convenient parameterization. And it tells us that we can identify uh, Goldstone modes we, with broken transformations, like in the case the Yuan transformations, that are mildly modulated in space and time. Okay? So performing a constant broken transformation would take us from one vacuum, say here, to another vacuum here. Having exciting a Goldstone field would mean that you are locally changing the vacuum essentially from space to phase, uh, from point to point in space time. So for uh, uh, chiral perturbation theory, we are going to use exactly this idea and uh, introduce the Goldstone modes by performing a broken transformation of uh, um, our order parameter. So the operators that by taking a web breaks the symmetry. And the broken transformation that we will consider is one where uh, L is equal to the complex conjugate, transpose conjugate of, uh, of R. 
and is equal to e to the i i a q a, where these q a are SU3 generators. Then when we do, when we perform this uh, trick, our VEV turns into uij of x, sorry, actually, uji of x. With u of x, just the product of the, of the two SU3 matrices, L of x and R dagger of x. It's also equal to e to the 2i i a of x q a. Okay, but these q a's are our bosons. Now, because we know how uh, SU3 left and SU3 right act on the two quark fields, they act linearly, we also can tell right away how um, these transformations will act uh, on you. Okay. They're gonna act like so, with an L on the left side and an R on the right side. Okay. And I'm putting a tilde on these transformations just so we don't get confused between the generic global transformations, uh, the chiral transformations that we might want to perform and uh, this L of X and R dagger of X that we used to parameterize uh, uh, mild uh, Golston excitations uh, around the web. Because U transforms uh, very so simply, it is actually easy to now to write down an action for U uh, that is invariant under chiral symmetry. To do that, we need to use also U dagger and also uh, some derivatives because uh, since U is a, a, an SU3 matrix, U times U dagger is equal to U dagger times U is just one. Right? So there is no non-trivial contraction that we can write down that doesn't involve any derivatives. And by Lorentz invariance, we need to have an even number of derivatives so that we can contract all the indices. And so at lowest order, the simplest thing we can write down that is invariant under chiral transformations and Lorentz symmetry looks like so. Oh, sorry. Minus F squared over four, trace over all the indices, d mu u dagger, d mu u. And you can convince ourselves that you, if you transform U in this way and you dagger in the conjugate way, both L tilde and R tilde will just drop out. And then of course there are corrections that are higher derivative corrections, but this is the dominant term in, the, um, in a derivative expansion. And so it's the leading term in our uh, chiral perturbation theory effective action. So I think, before I, I make a few general comments, I think this is a good time to pause and ask if there are any questions so far. Yes, so there are a couple of questions, Ricardo. The first one is from Sudipta, who is asking, can you please explain why the axial symmetry is anomalous? Okay. Uh, so that uh, uh, would take us uh, a little beyond uh, um, what uh, what we want to do here, but essentially, um, in a nutshell, uh, what you find is that uh, um, if you calculate uh, the the Noether current associated uh, with uh, uh, with u one with the u one axial, you find that it's for divergence. It's not. Uh, uh, it doesn't vanish. So there is no associated conserved charge. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's for divergence is equal to a factor that uh, depends on uh, uh, the field strength of the gluons. Okay, so like trace of uh, 
Jimmy New, Jimmy New. Uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, Trace. Um, sorry, the, the, there is a trace, but then the, 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 the Lorentz indices are contracted with an epsilon. Uh, and uh, I will say more about it uh, in, the, in the next lecture, but essentially this tells you, the, uh, the, this factor comes from loop corrections uh, and is the manifestation of the fact that uh, quantum corrections actually break uh, U1A and therefore don't uh, um, uh, ensure that there is no conserved quantity. So I'm sorry, I cannot go more into details just because of time, but I will try to comment a bit more on this uh, uh, in tomorrow's lecture. Yeah, Sudipta, if there are still doubts, uh, you can take advantage of the Q&A session tomorrow also. Definitely, definitely. So there is also, uh, so there are two more questions. The first one is from Andres, who's asking, where does the transformation for you comes from? Uh, so I'm assuming, uh, that Andres is referring to this I transformation. Think, uh, yes, I think that one. And uh, so you see, uh, because uh, we know how psi right and psi left transform, right? We said that our Lagrangian was invariant, uh, provided uh, uh, psi L and psi right transform like so where in this particular case, you know, we're focusing on the case where L and R are, um, are SU3 uh, transformations, then uh, if you take this, uh, uh, this definition and now you perform an SU3 left and an SU3 right transformation on the left hand side, the right hand side is gonna turn into whatever here. And so in this way, we can identify L dot U dot R dagger as the transformed of U under a chiral symmetry transformation. So we have one more question. Um, how can I see that there is a non-vanishing VEV for the quark bilinear? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you cannot see it analytically, okay? Because uh, um, it's, a, it's a strongly coupled, uh, it's a strongly coupled system. So uh, this is something that uh, one would need to see in uh, in numeric simulations, or uh, in an indirect way, you can assume that this is the case and derive the, the consequences of such spontaneous breaking and go and compare them with uh, uh, experimental observations. And it turns out that the pattern uh, that we see in terms of particles uh, and, uh, and also eventually their masses, we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, matches uh, quite well what we actually see in nature. Okay, Ricardo, so for the moment there are no further questions. Okay, very good. So then let me make uh, uh, some remarks about features of this effective action that are actually uh, fairly general features of any theory with, uh, with number goals on bosons. Uh, well, not, 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 not all of them, but uh, okay, you, you, I'll make it clear. So the first one is that um, this theory, this action at lowest order in derivative depends on one parameter and one parameter only, this F here. Uh, which has mass dimensions, and it's something that one will need to fit uh, against experimental data or numerical simulation. Okay. Now, in general, it, it's not true that any theory of Goldstone bosons at lowest order is going to have only one parameter, okay? But this happens to be so simple that it only has one parameter. And yet, notice that when we expand this action in power of the Goldstone fields, 
already a lowest order, it contains an infinite number of terms. So let me just uh, show you the first few. The first one, of course, no surprise here, is the kinetic term for the goldstones with a nice factor of a half that comes about because here I chose a, a, a factor of a quarter. I added it by hand to make our life simpler. And then uh, the first uh, interaction that appears is a non-normalizable interaction okay, with four fields and uh, two derivatives. A, e, mu, pi, v. And then there are going to be uh, terms with, say, two derivatives in six fields, eight fields, and so on and so forth. Okay? So by now, of course, we're not scared about non-renormalizable interactions anymore. Um, the remarkable thing is that we have one free parameter, but an infinite number of terms. And uh, the relative coefficients between all these terms are nailed by the spontaneously broken symmetry. Yeah. So the fact that a, a symmetry is spontaneously broken, it does not mean that the symmetry is not there, but it means that the symmetry is realized in a very complicated way, in a nonlinear way. And uh, it is precisely this nonlinear realization that, um, in order to be uh, successfully implemented, requires the, the fine tuning, the relative fine tuning of an infinite number of terms. To give you a sense of how complicated the transformation rules of the Goldstone spheres are, let's consider one particular transformation, which is one where L tilde is e to the two i epsilon a q a, and R tilde is just three, just unit matrix. Then, based on the transformation rules that uh, we wrote before, the transformed Goldstone field must be such that e to the uh, it's equal to this product e to the i pi a q a. Okay, and you can combine these two factors using the usual uh, Baker Baker Campbell Campbell Hausdorff. Uh, formula to combine uh, uh, exponential of uh, objects that do not commute with each other. And as you know, the result is a single exponential with an exponent that contains an infinite number of terms. I'm just going to write uh, the first few. Plus things of order pi squared times QA. OK. So this shows that the transformed field is actually an infinite sum of terms that contain arbitrarily high powers of, uh, um, of pi's of the original field. And it is in order to implement this complicated transformation property that you need the fine tuning between all these coefficients. Okay. So incidentally, this shows that it's much easier to work uh, with you rather than directly with the pies. Because okay? you transform in a very simple way, transform linearly, whereas the pies transform in a very complicated way. And so if we had to guess uh, the expanded action starting from uh, the explicit transformation property for the pies, uh, it would have taken us a very long time. Whereas uh, in, by working with the you, we were able to write down the action right away. So anytime you uh, work with Goldstone modes, 
you always want to find the smart combination of goldstone fields that uh, makes your life simple and transforms uh, in a in a in a nice way okay uh, rather than working directly with the with the pie fields and uh, um, there is actually a general method to do that uh, and, and i'm gonna say a few more words about that in a moment for now let me uh, continue saying that uh, uh, this nonlinear linearly symmetry here is clearly not manifest at the level of the expanded action. But another symmetry that is uh, manifest is uh, uh, our SU3 rotations of the pies. Okay? So transformations of the form pi A goes to VAB pi B, where this is an SU2 matrix. SU3 matrix. So this SU3 is actually the SU3 vector. And this is a general, another general result, which says that uh, the symmetries that are unbroken by your operator taking a web that remain unbroken, those symmetries are realized linearly on the Goldstone fields. And so the, the invariance there is manifest. Whereas the ones that are spontaneously broken are realized non-linearly and it's difficult to see um, just by naked eye that, uh, that the real action is invariant. So these are linear. Okay, and the last comment I want to make, huh? going back to uh, what I was saying before, the fact that you want to come up with uh, um, some smart combinations for the goals and fields. Huh? So notice that uh, uh, to write down our action, we use the uh, the matrix U I J, which is the fundamental representation of SU3, okay? So it's a three by three matrix. But we could have also worked with a different representation, any representation that we wanted of SU3. And had we done so, the relative tunings between the terms that are quadratic in pi, quartic in pi, sixtic in pi, and so on, would have remained the same. What would have changed is the coefficient that appears, the, the overall coefficient that appears in front of this whole combination. Okay? But of course, the coupling F, oops, sorry, the coupling f is already an arbitrary constant and so whatever extra coefficient you would obtain we can always just absorb it in this in this arbitrary coupling f and so this is another important lesson about uh, um, about uh, in general theories with number goals and bosons the particular representation that you use uh, essentially is uh, depends on what is the particular symmetry breaking mechanism, uh, particular mechanism that breaks the symmetry spontaneously. Okay? In this particular case, it was this bilinear operator, but in other theories, it could be a different uh, operator built out of, uh, um, out of quark field. Okay? In which case uh, the natural representation to use would be different. But at the end of the day, the information about the particular representation and therefore about the symmetry breaking mechanism is only going to affect the values of the Wilson coefficient in the effective theory. Okay, it can always be reabsorbed there. And this resonates with our, uh, with the ideology that we've been developing over the first two lectures, namely that the Wilson coefficient in an effective theory know something know what the UV is like, okay? That's their role. The particular values of these coefficients encode what the UV is like. Whereas uh, the particular structure uh, that we can write down in terms of the Goldstone fields, in this case, this particular combination, only depends on the symmetry breaking pattern. And by that, I mean only depends on the fact that we're breaking this group 
down to this subgroup. This is what is known as the symmetry breaking pattern. And in fact, there, is, there exists a, a, a method, a procedure known as a Cosette construction or also CCWZ by Callan, Coleman, Wes, and Sumino, the people that came up with it, uh, construction. Uh, that uh, allows you to derive what are the convenient building blocks to you to work with. If you want sort of the analog of, of, uh, of uh, D mu U, uh, it allows you to derive the convenient building blocks to use only starting from this information, right? What is the full symmetry group and down to what subgroup uh, are we breaking it? And from that information, this is an algebraic method that allows you to derive the convenient building blocks and to write down the action in a, in a much simpler way. Okay? I won't have time to uh, discuss this at length. Andrea mentioned that uh, uh, maybe he already did, or uh, uh, if not, he will in the next few lectures, uh, talk about the CCWZ construction in the context of, uh, um, of the Higgs sector of the standard model. Um, even though I won't be talking about it uh, explicitly, you can find uh, uh, some notes about it uh, in, uh, in chapter uh, three of my notes. And there I try to be a little general and discuss the situation where not only internal symmetries might be spontaneously broken, but also um, uh, some space-time symmetries. And there are added subtleties there uh, related to the fact that the standard Goldstone theorem applies only to internal symmetries, meaning that uh, it's only when internal symmetries are spontaneously broken that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of spontaneously broken symmetries and the number of Goldstone modes. When you break space-time symmetries, this one-to-one -one correspondence is no longer there. And in general, you're gonna end up with fewer Goldstone modes than the symmetries that you're breaking. And the Cosette construction is also able to account for that uh, by uh, using some, by imposing some additional constraints that are known as inversive constraints. Okay? So if you're ever interested in that, you can uh, find more material uh, in my notes. And uh, if you find yourself reading them, of course, and you have questions, feel free to bring them up during the Q&A. It goes without saying that uh, any exercises that are in that part of the section, you, you shouldn't feel uh, there is no need to do them unless, of course, you want to uh, try your hand at them, but uh, there is no need to, to hand them in for sure. Okay, so these were quite a lot of comments and uh, they're all quite important. So maybe I should take another break and ask if there are more questions about this before we slightly change topic. So for the moment, it appears that there are no further questions, but please, guys, feel free to ask or to raise your hands in the chat before we move on. Okay, Ricardo, it seems that there are no, no questions for the moment. Okay, then, uh, um, then let's continue. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the expansion parameter in uh, chiral perturbation theory is gonna be again a ratio of the energy, which could be the typical energy of a scattering process between Goldstone modes and uh, some strong coupling scale. So now let me say a few words about the strong coupling scale and try to give you a, an estimate for that. And also along the way, uh, try to dispel uh, a possible confusion that could arise. Okay. So first of all, uh, you see in this expanded option here, we have a scale in front, F squared. Now, typically for scalar fields, we like to work with uh, fields that are canonically normalized, well, for all fields, but for scalar fields, this means that the factor in front of the kinetic term should simply be this minus one half. Okay. And so we can introduce the canonically normalized field by just rescaling pi a by a factor of f. 
And uh, when we do that, we find that uh, our full action in general, uh, well, at lowest order, at least a second order in derivatives is gonna have this form, some coefficient CN, which are uh, factors of order one, which like we said, are nailed by symmetries. They're not up to us to choose. Then we have a d pi hat squared, pi hat over half to the two n. Okay. So it turns out that uh, uh, because of the properties of SU3 generators, all the uh, old terms vanish okay? and only the even terms survive. And we'll come back to that actually in the, in the next lecture. But this is what comes out from d mu u dagger d mu u. So you see that higher and higher powers of uh, uh, pi are suppressed by the scale f. Okay? But this is emphatically not the strong coupling scale. Even though it suppresses, uh, um, you know, uh, non-renormalizable operators, uh, it suppresses higher powers of the fields, not higher powers of derivatives. Whereas we know that, uh, um, um, whereas the, the strong coupling scale here is what suppresses if you want higher powers of derivative. And so in general, without expanding it, our full action is going to take this form, so depend on u and u dagger, and then on derivatives divided by the strong coupling scale lambda. And you can convince yourself that uh, if you write down something just uh, uh, with two derivatives, then the lambdas that suppress two derivatives are gonna cancel exactly the lambda squared that I put here up front. And you're gonna be left with a factor of F squared and recover the action that we wrote before, okay? So, to estimate what lambda is, uh, we can use again um, a sort of naturalness argument. And compare uh, the three level contribution to an amplitude for two to two scattering of Goldstones with the uh, the one loop correction. Now, because the quartic vertex looks like so, as four pi's and two derivatives, when I canonically normalize uh, the field pi, it's gonna pick up uh, some uh, uh, four inverse powers of f, two of which will cancel with the, the f square in front. And uh, also from here, I can see that uh, the, th this uh, contact interaction is gonna scale like e squared over f squared. Now, what about the loop correction? Well, the loop correction is gonna scale like uh, um, a loop factor, usually a four pi squared that arises anytime you you integrate uh, um, over the momentum running in the loop. And then there is going to be one power of e squared over f squared for each of these two vertices. So I will square that. And then of course, and here I'm being a little schematic, you will have an integral over the, um, the momentum running in the loop and you have two propagators in the loop. So that's effectively like a one over k to the fourth, which means that this is essentially dimensionless. Okay, this can produce a log if you want, or some constant. And so the whole loop correction here can be rewritten in this form, e squared over f squared, so something of the same order as the three level correction, times, uh, e over four pi f 
O squared. Okay. Now, of course, uh, there will be also uh, another uh, correction of this order, which comes from uh, uh, the term in the effective action with four derivatives. Okay? So if I take a contact interaction with four derivatives, it will also give me something that scales like e to the fourth, exactly like this loop contribution. Right? And in general, that's going to be suppressed by some scale over the lambda to the fourth. Okay. So now you see that uh, um, in order for this loop correction not to be larger, uh, so th this loop correction is going to be smaller than uh, the three level correction as long as e the energy is less than 4 pi f. And this 4 pi f is uh, also the, uh, the maximum value that our strong coupling scale can take. Okay. In other words, if we, uh, if we didn't add any additional operators in the Lagrangian, our effective theory would break at this scale for pi f. If we add other operators with Wilson coefficients that are anomalously large, our effective theory could stop working even sooner than that. But at the very least, it's going to break at a scale for pi f. And uh, uh, therefore, this becomes uh, sort of like a natural expectation for uh, what the strong coupling scale of the effective theory should be. Now, this factor of four pi in between f and the strong coupling scale, it's actually crucial because uh, uh, when you compare eventually, uh, when you reintroduce the effect of, uh, of quark masses and so on, uh, and you compare with data, you find uh, that uh, f is of order roughly 90 MeV, okay? And in fact, it's smaller than the mass of the pion. And so if F were the strong coupling scale, we would actually be in trouble because it means that, uh, um, that essentially even for the lightest meson that, that we can observe, uh, we would not be able to apply this theory. Okay, the lightest meson will already, will already be beyond the reach of this effective theory. Whereas this factor of four pi, which is a factor of order 10, pushes the, the strong coupling scale up to order GV. And so it gives us eventually a self-consistent framework to describe uh, um, light mesons. Okay. So the next thing I would like to do is discuss how we can reintroduce uh, the effect of quark masses and the effect of electromagnetism. Because uh, so far, chiral perturbation predicts eight number goldstone bosons. And when we go and turn on our accelerator, we find that uh, uh, there are no number goldstone bosons in nature, um, at, at least in, in, in particle physics. Um, and so uh, the discrepancy is due to the fact that uh, so far we have neglected uh, uh, quark masses and electromagnetism. So before I turn to discussing approximate symmetries, maybe let me pause one more time and see if there are more questions. So for the moment, no, it doesn't seem there are for further questions. Okay. Does anybody have some urgent question and wants to raise his hand? Her or his hand? Okay, I think you're being that clear, Ricardo. Hopefully, or, or not that unclear, so we'll see. Uh, I, uh, I, I prefer to see the positive uh, option. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, but if uh, other, you know, if people raise their hand, uh, in the meantime, feel free to, to jump in. Uh, uh, yes, there we go. yeah, sure. So, okay, uh, very good. As we said, you know, chiral symmetry is only an approximate symmetry. Uh, it's broken 
by, by two effects, by the fact that it is, there is a small uh, electromagnetic coupling, okay? And so there is a small dimensionless parameter and uh, uh, we have quark masses. And now the small uh, dimensionless parameter is, if you want, the ratio of the quark masses divided by the strong coupling scale. So in order to take these effects into account, we're going to use a, a trick which is used in general in any effective theory whenever you're interested in uh, discussing uh, approximate symmetry. So you start with, uh, uh, as we did in the limit where the symmetries are exact, and then uh, you make the following observation. In the particular context of our theory, let me add to our initial quark Lagrangian the following term. Where M is some field which is known as spurion field. So this is a generic term anytime we have to deal, we are dealing with, uh, uh, with approximate symmetries. Now this term would be uh, perfectly invariant under chiral symmetries if this spurium field transformed uh, linearly like so. On the other hand, this term also reduces to the term, the quark masses term that we dropped when MJK is just the diagonal constant matrix with the quark masses along the diagonal. And so the, uh, the strategy here is to pretend uh, that uh, these quark masses really form, uh, um, are, if you want, the VEV of some spurion field, and write down an effective action that uh, um, contains not just uh, now the Goldstone fields, but also the spurion fields. And so it's going to be an expansion in derivative over lambda. And because eventually the VEV. Uh, uh, of the spurion is going to be small compared to the strong coupling scale. It's going to depend on the spurions uh, in this in this way. Okay. So at lowest order, the um, sorry be before I say uh, that, let me. Uh, back up for a moment uh, and emphasize one thing, namely that anytime you have uh, um, an approximate symmetry, you can think of that as uh, introducing new expansion parameters in your effective theory. Okay? Without explicit symmetry, our expansion parameter was E over lambda. Now we also have a small dimensionless parameter, E, and uh, this ratio of masses, right? So there was a question which was, uh, uh, you know, when is it that we uh, expansion parameters can be ratios of masses? Uh, this, for instance, is an example where the, the quark masses and the mass scale corresponding to the strong coupling scale give you a ratio that you can use an expansion parameter. And so a lowest order in the expansion parameter associated with the quark masses the correction to the Lagrangian for chiral perturbation theory looks like so. There is some coupling Y of order one uh, on naturalness ground. And then the trace of M over lambda times U plus the emission quotient. And you can convince yourself that uh, if M were to transform like so, that this term would actually be invariant under chiral perturbation theory. And there, sorry, under chiral symmetry. But now when we replace M with uh, its, uh, um, uh, with its VEV, we can expand U in powers of the Goldstone fields and derive uh, an infinite tower of interactions that uh, break 
chiral symmetry by an amount that is controlled by the ratio of quark masses over lambda. And in particular, if you expand uh, up to quadratic order in the fields, uh, you find, not surprisingly, that because these terms break chiral symmetry, that uh, your number of Wollstone moles uh, acquire a mass. Okay. But the way in which they acquire a mass uh, is not random, is not, uh, not every number of Wollstone mole has a different mass. But in fact, uh, these modes are arranged into three pairs. Uh, and I'm writing here the actual particles with which uh, these pairs are identified. And here I'm writing their, uh, um, uh, their masses. Okay. And we have uh, K plus and K minus. mu plus ms, then we have k0, k bar 0, y lambda md plus ms. So there are these three pairs. And then the fourth pair actually has uh, a mass matrix with some non-diagonal elements. Looks mu plus md, mu minus md, mu minus md, and one third mu plus md plus four ms. Okay, very good. So this is quite non-trivial, right? Because you could have expected all the ghost modes to develop a different mass. And instead, there are relations, some trivial relations between the masses of the Gaussian modes. Okay. And uh, we can further refine, if you want, uh, our, uh, um, uh, our discussion of masses and symmetries by introducing, uh, by rewriting our expansion parameters, uh, say, mu over lambda L, md over lambda, trading them for the sum of the two and the difference of the two. And the reason why it's interesting to do is because, as you can tell here, the, the off-diagonal components of, uh, um, of this matrix are precisely proportional to mu minus md. And so at lowest order uh, in this parameter, where uh, mu is approximately equal to md, then uh, this matrix element, uh, uh, the off-diagonal ones vanish. And uh, you find that the pi zero acquires exactly the same mass as the pi plus and the pi minus. And this is because in the limit where mu and md become equal, the VEV of the spurion is invariant under an SU2 transformation of the first uh, uh, two entries. Right? And this additional SU2 symmetry that you obtain in this limit is not in bad, the isospin symmetry. Okay? And so pi zero, pi plus, and pi minus in that limit form a, a triplet under, uh, um, under isospin SU2. And uh, moreover, always in this uh, isospin limit, there is a non-trivial relation known as the gelman okubo relation, which relates the mass of the pi's, the mass of the eta, to the mass of all the k of all the k's, which also become uh, the generic in this limit. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, so you see that there are non-trivial relations between the masses of the state that you observe, uh, and uh, 
the power of the spurious analysis is that it allows us to derive these relations, which otherwise would have been very hard to get. Okay. Now we can play exactly the same game with uh, uh, electromagnetic interactions. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, uh, the electromagnetic interactions we neglected before can be written like so, E times a new times psi bar LJ gamma mu QL JK psi K of L plus an analogous term with L replaced by R. And once again, if QL and the QR that lives in the last term um, where to transform like so and similarly for the QR, then these terms would be uh, would be invariant. Right? On the other hand, uh, when uh, the when QL and QR reduced to the following matrices. Two thirds, minus one third, minus one third. Then uh, uh, this gives us precisely the um, the electromagnetic interactions that we, we neglected at the beginning, okay? So the strategy is, is again, the same. We are going to uh, now couple these spurium fields Q to our uh, Goldstone modes. And uh, at lowest order, the, the term, the only term we can write down has the following form. F squared lambda squared and E squared times a Y prime over two trace of Q L U Q R U dagger plus emission conjugate. You can convince yourself if, that if Q L and Q R transform in these ways, that this term will be invariant. Now, a word about uh, this E squared that I added here. That term should be there because uh, you see the terms that I just added uh, that depend on, on the spurion are invariant under inverse rescalings of uh, the coupling E and uh, the spurions. Okay? This means that uh, the actual size of Q cannot have any physical meaning. And therefore, any time a Q appears, it needs to appear in combination with E. Okay? So that's why I added by end an E square here. And then the Y prime is gonna be another order one dimensionless, uh, dimensionless quantity on naturalness grounds, okay? So you can play the same game. Now expand these terms. Uh, uh, so set, uh, uh, replace QL and QR with their revs expand in powers of pi's and uh, uh, at quadratic order you can find how the masses of uh, the would be number goldstone modes get uh, get affected and what you find is that uh, the only uh, masses that uh, change are the masses of the pi plus and pi minus and the relative change is y prime e squared times f squared. Sorry. And quite remarkably, the other mass that changes is the mass of the k plus and k minus, and it changes by precisely the same amount. 
So the fact that uh, uh, the change in masses of these two different uh, particles is the same at lowest order in the electromagnetic coupling uh, goes under the name of Dachshund's theorem. And uh, by comparing the um, expressions for the masses that arise when you consider the, the quark masses, you see that in the limit where uh, uh, isospin is an exact symmetry, so u and d have the same mass, and therefore pi zero, pi plus and pi minus would have the same mass. The only difference between the mass of the pi zero and the mass of the pi plus and pi minus comes from uh, electromagnetic interactions. Very good. So uh, I'm gonna say now a few words about uh, uh, naturalness and pseudo number Goldstone bosons. Uh, this is gonna be the last topic for the day. So before we tackle that, uh, let me stop one more time and see if in the meantime, there are more questions. Yes, there is one question from Sudipta who is asking why the mass of the neutral particles are a, are a matrix. So why, I guess why there is a mix in between pi zero and eta. Um, uh, um, I don't think I have a deep, uh, um, a deep answer for that uh, other than uh, uh, the fact that uh, of diagonal elements in this matrix are uh, um, are perfectly compatible with uh, uh, with all the symmetries, and um, and therefore, um, if it's allowed by the symmetries, uh, that's one of the mantras of effective theories. Uh, if it's allowed by the symmetries, it should be there. Okay, so for the moment, it seems that there are no further questions. Okay. Ah, no, sorry, sorry. There is one more question uh, from Lucas. Uh, how does this result for the correction to the charge pi on mass uh, compares to the experimental value? So, uh, very good. Um, that's a good question. And to be honest, I will need to look it up. So I'm not uh, a phenomenologist by training, so I don't remember these uh, numbers off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if maybe if you and Rico know this. Uh, if not, I certainly look it up. Uh, so I don't know them by hand, but I believe they are they're okay with the phenomenologically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're certainly comparable. And, yes. No. Uh, uh, how, how much quantitatively? I, I I honestly do not remember. Yeah, so that they are, you know, right order of magnitude. And by that I mean, so of course there is a, a, an arbitrary coupling here, Y prime, but in order to make uh, things work out, so to match the data, um, you don't need to choose this Y prime in an outrageous way. So to have it, you know, a factor of uh, 100 or a factor of 1000. So it can be a number of one. Okay, so I think for the moment that's it. Uh, you have uh, 10 more minutes, Ricardo. Okay, very good. So let me just uh, uh, conclude with uh, a few remarks about uh, naturalness uh, and uh, symmetry protection. Okay, so. Um, Yesterday, we discussed how scalar masses are in general UV sensitive, meaning that uh, their, um, the loop corrections to the mass parameters are proportional to the strong coupling scale. Okay? And we discussed how that uh, uh, leads to difficulties, say in the case of the standard model and so on and so forth. Now, uh, oh, wrong pen. If we identify the strong coupling scale with 4 pi f, we can rewrite the mass uh, 
of, uh, for instance, uh, of the pi plus and pi minuses as follows, okay, as y times uh, mu plus md over lambda plus y prime e squared over four pi squared times lambda squared. Okay. And so naively, this looks a bit like uh, the, um, at face value, like the natural value for the scalar mass that we discussed uh, uh, yesterday, right? If you remember um, in our toy model, we found that the natural value for the mass of the scalar, which we back then we denoted with capital M, was of order y squared over four pi squared with y a small number times the strong capping scale. And so at face value, these two things don't look uh, very different, right? Because these are small parameters, some strong capping scale. These are small parameters, time strong capping scale. So it will look like these two things uh, are similar and we should be worried now about naturalness of, of the Goldstone modes of, of, of the Masons and so on, right? However, there is a, a, a very, very important difference, namely that this coupling Y here in our toy model describe the strength of the coupling between UV modes and higher modes. So it's a parameter that uh, you have access to uh, when you talk about the full theory, which includes both UV and IR modes. Okay. If you're only stuck with the IR, then uh, a priori, you don't know how strongly your light particles will couple to the heavy particles. And uh, that's something you need to figure out uh, uh, with experiments, okay? And then uh, it's only when you have the full theory that you can tell whether you happen to have a naturalness problem or not. Instead, the small parameters that appear here in front of the mass of the pions, these are small parameters uh, that are purely small by definition within the EFT, okay? So these are expansion parameters of the EFT that control the amount by which quark masses on the one hand and electromagnetism on the other hand break chiral symmetry. So, uh, like I said, these parameters must be small by definition because otherwise, if these parameters were large, uh, we simply couldn't uh, treat our mesons as uh, approximately as goes to modes and therefore our whole construction would crumble. Right? So the whole self-consistency of the EFT guarantees in this case uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the meson masses are parametrically smaller than the stroke of the scale. Whereas in our toy model, you are at the mercy of the UV completion to uh, realize a parametric separation between the strong capping scale and the mass of the scalar. So in a sense, what happens here for the Goldstone modes is very similar to what happens for the fermions. Right? There we found that uh, the mass of the fermions was of order M, meaning the loop corrections were automatically small. And we can also rewrite this in a trivial way as M over lambda times lambda, where this ratio M over lambda uh, lambda being the strong coupling scale, is the parameter that controls the explicit breaking of the discrete symmetries psi goes to gamma phi psi, phi goes to minus phi. So when you phrase things in this language, what's going on with the ghost of modes is exactly the same thing that is going on uh, with the fermion uh, uh, in, in our toy model. And uh, for this reason, uh, one usually says that uh, uh, in this case, the mass 
of, of, of these fields, of these scalars, uh, is protected by the nonlinear realized symmetry. Okay? Now, scalars uh, whose mass uh, are uh, uh, protected, uh, whose masses are protected by nonlinear realized symmetries are known as pseudo Nambu Goldstone bosons. And so there was a question the other day about mechanisms to uh, keep a scalar light. Um, and, uh, and Susie would mention, and another mechanism is uh, having a, a nonlinear realized symmetry that, that protects the, the scalar mass. Okay, I think this is a good, uh, good time to stop. So let me stop here and maybe we can see if there, is, uh, if there are any more questions. Okay, great. So just maybe to clarify, uh, it was pointed out that the expression that you wrote m pi plus mano should be m squared plus pi plus Oh, mano. yes. Yes, you're absolutely just, right. Thank uh, you if, if there are students that didn't check the chat. Uh, yeah, so right. there are no further questions. So is there something urgent, guys? Some Somebody wants to raise his hand, uh, her or his hand, uh, and ask something on the fly? Okay, Ricardo, it seems that like everybody's happy. Okay. Which is uh, very good, <laughs> marvelous. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let me let me thank you again for the very, very nice lecture. Uh, let me also thank, uh, ah, okay, so we have a question. So let me let me ask you this, uh, this quick question. Is there a mass difference between B0 and B plus mesons? Uh... Okay, this is a question for, for a phenomenologist. Um, I would think so, but uh, uh, so uh, I okay, I would need to review my knowledge of mesons, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the B mesons contain other quarks and therefore they're not captured by, by character division theory and uh, uh, and so any mass difference that you have there needs to be accounted for in a, in a, in a different way. Yes, uh, so maybe maybe I can add uh, on this. Please, so, okay. Yes, there is, a, there is a small mass difference between B0 and B, and B plus meson. But then you need to be, to be careful because you have various types of B mesons. You have B sub D, B sub S. So you need to, to really point, pinpoint the other quark that is coupling with B. But as Ricardo was mentioning, the B quark is uh, above the strong coupling scale uh, that is allowing you to get this mass separation and uh, at, the, at the end of the day, right in the current perturbation theory. So to write down your theory for, for the B meson, you need to use other techniques uh, like heavy meson theory, which is something completely different, okay? It's not, uh, it's not current perturbation theory. So this is just to, just to answer the question. So something else before we close the day. Okay, so it seems like everybody is happy. So Ricardo, thanks again for the very nice lecture. Thank you everybody for the participation. Once more, it was a very, very nice, very nice and very stimulating day. So we reconvene tomorrow.